friends, Dave Politis, k Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. This is a missing person segment. And we're going to talk about a park and a location very, very close to my heart. And I wrote about it extensively in Missing 411 Eastern United States. I need to tell you something that when I first started off on my research, I went to the government to get details. After a short period of time, the National Park Service kind of got on to what I was doing and threw every roadblock imaginable into my path to ensure that I couldn't get the reports I was looking for. Finally, what they did is they classified me as a commercial requester and they stated that I'd have to pay commercial prices for any request I made. It's like 50 cents a page, $200 to start the search. Searches were going to cost me $1,000 with all the paperwork. And when you're requesting a couple hundred per year, you don't have that kind of money. It was a strategy to ensure that I didn't get the information out of the missing persons cases. But when I first started, I got a lot of them. And I'll explain that to you as we go on today. We found ways around this by using people like you to do our searches. And we've got some people out there right now that'll do that. But the first case I'm going to talk to you about involves a park that I, I have spent as much time in that park as any park in the world, and that is Great Smoky Mountain National Park in Tennessee and North Carolina. Why was I in that park? Well, my brother from another mother, Scott Carpenter. Scott was in the Air Force. He loved to fish and hunt. He's a member of our team. He's a patriot. He was a Christian. He was one of the nicest men you would have ever met. And Scott died recently from a brain aneurysm. Huge blow to me. He was probably one of the closest people to me and he had taken me innumerable times into Great Smoky Mountain National Park. And I gotta say that every time we went in there, I, I will never forget it. S something bizarre, unusual happened every time we went in there. And it was no way Scott could have made it up. <clears throat> One time we went in the park, we were off trail, and uh, he'd always give me one of his guns to carry when we were in there, because there was everything in there, deadly snakes, everything was in there. Anyhow, we're in there one time, and we walk up on a group of wild hogs, huge hogs, big tusks, and they kind of looked at us, and I'm thinking, oh, don't come towards us. And they didn't. But they were rooting and making a mess in the ground. They were huge. Seen bear in there many times. It's a great place, great park. Lots of great memories, thanks to one man, Scott Carpenter. So let's get into the first story. It involves a man named Gordon Kay, 69 years old and went missing April 26th of last year. Yeah, very recent. He was retired and living in Tampa, Florida. Gordon was raised and born in Pennsylvania and then had lived in Georgia and Pennsylvania during his life. He had two daughters. Family stated that he was an extremely experienced hunter and hiker. And he loved going into the lush mountains of the Great Smokies. <clears throat> we planned a trip and he got a 14-day camping pass from the Park Service 
to go into the park. Well, he was last seen on April 23rd at the Deep Creek Campground in the North Carolina side of the park. I almost fell out of my chair when I heard this. Why? Again, I know the park really well. There's been a lot of people that have disappeared in that park. And that location said, uh-oh. I wonder if they're going to find this guy. Well, the family knew that he should have been out of that park by the 26th, and they hadn't heard from him. So the family notified the National Park Service, and they moved in to that area to start the search. Now, a little bit about the park. This was the first park I had ever been in, and I asked Scott about it when we first drove in. I thought, where's the gates that you have to pay to get in? He goes, oh no, this park's totally free. What? I mean, Glacier, Yosemite, Yellowstone, you got to pay fees to get in there. No, not here. And this is the park that has some of the highest volume of visitors anywhere. Uh, a couple years ago, there were 11.3 million people that visited. As an example, Glacier right near my house, 3.2 million. So they get over triple the amount of people. Now, the, this park... When you're hiking in it, it is so lush, so thick. Uh, biodiversity, over 240 types of birds in this area, 1,500 species of plants, 50 kinds of fish. It's bizarre. And snakes, <laughs> yes, and snakes. One time, uh, twice, twice I was with Scott in the park. One time we were with Angie and Scott was in the lead and we were off trail and he jumped back and he goes, holy cow, there's a deadly snake. And we moved back and we found a way around it. Another time I was in there with him and we were coming downhill and he jumped probably 20 feet off the side of this hill <laughs> to miss this snake. We never want to kill anything, but yeah, there's a lot of snakes there, a lot of water, lush. Example, another time we were in there, middle of summertime. It's probably 95 degrees and 100% humidity. And there was like fog. It was two o'clock in the afternoon. There's like fog in the, in the forest as we're walking along. Well, you could see through it, but it, the mist was so heavy. The humidity was so high, it was, it was so gross, but it's a great day. Now, one of the times that we were in the park was with survivor man, Les Stroud. I was the location supervisor and Scott was part of the on-screen talent with, with Les. And I just didn't want to go on screen then. It, it was a special Les was doing about Bigfoot and Scott had so many encounters in there that Les wanted to go with it, so we went in there, and it was a good day. We had a lot of fun. Now, as far as Gordon, Gordon's family contacted the National Park Service. They started to contact other agencies. They found his car at the Deep Creek Campground, which is important. It proves that he was still there. So. This is, the, this is North Carolina over here. This is the Deep Creek Campground. This is where they were staying. This is Whittier, North Carolina. This is Tennessee over on this side. Cades Cove, Clingman's Dome. This is all National Park. From here to here, there's nothing. I've documented people that have disappeared here that have never been found. Here that have never been found. And other parts of this park never been found. It's thick and lush all through here.
Now, I'm not trying to be evasive, but what were Scott and I doing in the park? Doing Bigfoot research all over that park. Has one of the, probably the largest populations of Bigfoot around, which is why Scott got so much DNA force there. I don't care what anybody says, you could do an online search on YouTube and there's people that have made other videos in the park about Bigfoot and they've seen him there. Not just Scott. Now Gordon, they found his car. They found somebody that saw him on the 23rd of April and they start searching. They originally started with 15 searchers on the North Carolina side and several canine teams. And the search and rescue escalated for several days, went from 15 to 30 to 50 to 100 people. And they used equestrians, canine teams, and ground pounders. Probably one of the largest searches in the last 10 years in the park. In total, they used 300 searchers from four states, 57 different agencies committed people. The search lasted 11 days. That's a long search. And the Park Service says it was transitioning to a monitoring, keeping posters up, etc. One thing I want you to think about, if there had been five or 10 searches from this one campground, the Deep Creek Campground, then obviously flashing yellow lights would be all around here. People would be on alert, people would be, don't stay there, there's a lot of missing people. But I can almost guarantee when Gordon went in there, there was never any word about any missing person from that location. So if you have a case out of there every 15 to 20, 30 years, nobody thinks about it. It doesn't mean anything, it has no relevance. And one of the last things that I read about Gordon was by his family, and it said that he was possibly having a mental health issue at the time. I think about this and I, when that blanket statement is made, I'm not sure what that really means. Was he bipolar, schizophrenic? They didn't say that. Just saying he was having a mental health issue. Now having been in the UFO and Bigfoot world for many, many years, decades, I can tell you that some family members think that if you're following and researching those two topics, you have a mental health issue. Some family members think I have a mental health issue because I'm interested in those topics. They won't talk to me, but that's fine. It bothers me a lot, but I've got to live with that. Now, that happened in April of 2023 when Gordon disappeared. And now it's been 10 months. No, nothing's been found of him. With the number of searchers, canines, that they had on that man, they should have found his something of him, something. They found nothing, makes no sense. But this park and the disappearances it's had in it, that result makes sense to me at some level. This is the missing person poster that was put out by the Park Service and Swain County Sheriff's about Gordon Kay. If he had the backpacking hunting experience that the family stated, then Gordon was used to going off trail. That wouldn't have surprised anybody. Now the grid searching that the park did was over a vast, vast area that kept getting bigger. To think that he out walked that area that they were searching, very hard to believe. Very hard to believe. But if that case made you think, the next case is going to make your head swivel. Same exact campground. 
Except this time, it was 42 years ago. Remember what I said about spreading things out, nothing makes sense anymore, nobody remembers. Well, when I made this next case famous in this book, I made it famous because I got the case file from the National Park Service, so I had details that nobody else had. And it was only after that book came out where I made all of these cases public that the National Park Service started to put out these. This is a missing person poster that they put out now on their cases. This was not out before I wrote about this case. This lady right here on this poster is Thelma Pauline Melton. She was 58 years old when she disappeared September 25th, 1981 from the same campground that Gordon Kay disappeared from, where his truck was parked. Now Thelma was married to a man named Robert. Robert had heart problems, he was frail. They were residences of Jacksonville, Florida. Every summer since 1958, the Meltons pulled their Airstream trailer from Florida to North Carolina, and they parked it at the Deep Creek Campground in Swain County. Now, I've never been involved in trailer camping and this and that, but I do understand from talking to people that it's very social. And that Robert and Polly, she went by the name of Polly, had a very active social circle of couples that came every year to the same campground. And they set up and they played games, they hiked, they did cookouts, played cards. Everyone got along real well, all retired couples. And all of the people at this campground had one thing in common. They loved the outdoors and they loved the park. As Polly did too. Now, she and her friends loved to go out into the park, walk around, and they'd been coming for so many years that Polly could have drawn the maps for the trail system in that area. She had hiked them so many times. Keep that in the back of your mind. So on September 25th, 1981, the Meltons and the Cannons, another family, each pulling trailers, had arrived from Florida into the campground. They pulled their trailer in, and you go through a process of pulling the trailer in and setting it up just right and getting things out of the trailer to make your area look like yours, take out the awning, put out chairs, tables, makes it your living room. That's what they were doing when they got there. Now, before I go any further, people will say, well, Dave, how do you know all this? Because the National Park Service wrote one heck of a report about this case. And they dove into it head first, and they did a massive report. And in that, there were a lot of things that you wouldn't find in a normal police report about what had happened. They had a timeline, they had contacts, they did a good job on this, considering it was 1981. So they pulled into the campgrounds. At 11.15, the, uh, Polly and Mrs. Cannon decided that they had, were going to cut up some apples that they had purchased, and they were going to dry them. At noon, Polly went over and had lunch with Robert, who was still setting up the camp. So they sat around for a couple hours, talked. And then Polly... At 3.15 that afternoon, Polly, Pauline Cannon, and a friend named Trula, who was also camping there, started a hike from their trailers to a trail that parallels Deep Creek. And that's a creek that has water in it that runs almost all year. And that was called the Deep Creek Trail. Now, they were at the Deep Creek Campground, same one as Gordon Kay. Now, the trail is a long, smooth gravel road. Cars could drive up and down it, but none do. It's for emergencies. 
And that is not inside the park. But then that road dead ends in the park and it turns into a trail. The ladies said that they saw a few equestrians and a few waders in the creek. Nothing unusual, things that they always saw. And they walked for a long time and they finally reached a point that they usually turned around and they decided to. And as they decided to turn around, the women commented on the pace that Polly was keeping at this point to go back to her trailer. She had commented about 15 minutes before how thirsty she was, but she didn't want to drink any water out of the river and that she'd wait till she got back to the trailer. So once they reached the turnaround, Polly put it in gear and was hiking pretty fast. And one of the ladies, Miss Cannon said, I wouldn't want to race you, Polly. She yells that to her as she's walking ahead. Polly waves. Polly got about 75 yards in front of the ladies. And they saw her go over a slight knoll on the trail. And as she got to the other side of the knoll, she got out of view. They were inside the park. This was on the trail. About 45 minutes later, the ladies get back into the campground and they go over to Polly's trail trailer and they see Robert sitting there alone. And they said, hey, is Polly around? Robert says, she never got back from the hike with you guys. They said, what? He said, no, she never came back. And they said, well, she was way ahead of us on the trail. She should have been back before us. The ladies get their husbands and they get more people and they start searching the campground. And then they decide that they're gonna send three or four people up the trail to the area they lost sight of her and search that area. Well, they did. And they did an extensive search according to the reports. This wasn't a half-hearted effort. This was a friend of theirs. At about five o'clock, they got back and nobody had found anything. Nobody knew had entered the campground. Nobody had left the campground because they knew everybody. And at 6.30 that night, Robert calls the National Park Service and Swain County Sheriff's and reports his wife missing. The sheriffs come out, the National Park comes out. They start to interview all of the ladies that were with Polly. They interview Robert. They try to understand her physical ability. She was in good shape. She wasn't like Robert. If she had any other contacts, any other people she knew in that area, no, no. So the next day, the National Park Service brings out canines and 30 searchers and they go up that deep creek trail in the area where she was last seen and they start to grid search that area, which is exactly what they should have done. And they bring canines with them with a scent from Polly and the canines can't pick up a scent. Well, now that's odd. Why is that odd? It's odd because the women saw her on the trail go over the knoll, but then that was it. So the search goes on for a week. They got nothing. They came down from, so again, this is the North Carolina side. This is a deep creek campground. Trail goes up into the park. Well, they decided to put searchers in at Klingman's Dome, Dome and come down into this area and they put searchers here and they went up. They found nothing. They found no tracks. They found nothing. October 2nd, a week after the search started, the National Park Service supervisor in charge of the search was a man named Dennis Barrett. He made a statement to the press. It was, if she had been in the park, dogs would have found her. Friends, one of the most insane comments I've ever heard of a search supervisor say at Rocky or at Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Why is that? Because I had written about many disappearances in the park prior to Polly, where the people were never found and canines never found them. 
including a small boy that didn't leave the park, as Barrett says. So he wanted, in my opinion, he wanted to wash his hands of this. Oh, you know what? She must have left the park with somebody and that way we don't have to search for her anymore and the canines didn't, didn't foul up. But here's something unusual that happened. He made a comment that the FBI had joined the case. Oh, what? FBI does not research or investigate missing adults. No, they don't. So why would they come into the park and be interested in somebody who disappeared inside of a national park on a rural trail with no evidence of a crime and no suspects? I'll tell you why. Because the FBI was involved in the other searches in this park. They were interested in what was happening at this park because they couldn't understand what was happening. They couldn't understand why people weren't being found. They couldn't understand how these people could disappear in the park so, so quickly. Now, Polly was probably just three minutes ahead of the ladies. Not that far. After the search got started, Robert had some complications with his heart and he had to be hospitalized. He was so shaken by this. There were theories that came out that Polly started a new life somewhere with some guy she found. Polly was 58 years old. Let's start with that. Park Service has investigators. They aren't idiots. Now you get the FBI involved in your team and you say, okay, well, what if they thought that she started a new life with somebody else? Well, 58 years old, well, in the years that followed, she, was get, she had to have been getting Social Security. Well, if you're getting Social Security, you're starting a new life with somebody else, then you're changing your Social Security and you're getting it somewhere else. All they have to do is check with the Social Security Administration. The FBI has that access and find out where she moved. Well, of course, of course this never happened. She never moved. She was never found. There was never any follow-up about where she could have moved to. No. Thelma Pauline Melton disappeared on a rural trail in Great Smoky Mountain National Park. The same trail coming off the same campground that Gordon Kay disappeared on just 10 months ago. I have always stated that that park is one of the most unusual parks I've ever been for a variety of reasons. I don't know what happened to these people, but it makes no sense that canines can't find them. But as you've known, if you are a villager and you've watched my 700 plus videos on this channel, you understand the huge number of people that haven't been found by canines, and it's huge. But why is it consistent at Great Smoky Mountain National Park? A very good question. I never found out if Robert was able to come out of the hospital. But when I was writing the story, if you, if you were an older person, Robert was in his 60s and you spent your life with somebody like he did with Polly. Loading up that Airstream and heading back to Jacksonville, Florida to a life of loneliness, that's a bitter pill to swallow. And lastly, I've stated before, I think it's important where people come from. I don't know if this means anything. Gordon was from Tampa, Florida. Polly was from Jacksonville, Florida. Is that just mere coincidence? I don't know. 
I think it's an odd coincidence if it is. This, our new hats just came out with that new pin right there. The Liberty hat. It's got my son's initials on the side. It's got our website on the back. Understand what that word liberty means. It's a very important word. You get the hat. Get my latest book, Missing 411 Washington, at our website, NA, like North America, NA, BigfootSearch.com. Go, go to the online store. You can find it there. Thanks for being here. Please share this on your web, website, social media, wherever. I'd appreciate it. Politis out.